Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is afternoon when I'm recording this on Saturday. Uh, if you're watching this or listening, it's because you know that we are not having service on uh, this Lord's Day because of the snowstorm that is pending at this point and seems like it indeed is coming. So uh, we are having to uh, pretend like it's May 2020 and uh, record the uh, sermon on Saturday and then send it out to you uh, later today. And then you can uh, listen to it also on Sunday through the phone in service. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we're talking about today is asking God, asking God. That is the uh, title of the message. It could be something like asking God and him saying no, something like that. Something I think that we all have some awareness of, something that we're all uh, keyed into and that we've all maybe wrestled with over the course of the years. My text that I'm going to be uh, dealing with today, one is out of Luke 11, verses 9 to 13, and then the other is out of James 4, verse 3. And I'm just going to start off by reading these passages. Jesus says in Luke 11, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And then James 4.3, uh, writing right on the back of that, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Well, I'm still sort of preaching out of the crucible, uh, like I mentioned last week, uh, preaching out of kind of the, the spiritual sort of crucible that I've been going through here personally over the last, uh, over the last month uh, at this point, several weeks into a month now, and appreciate all the, the prayers and the concern and cards and messages and things like that. Um, but uh, so I just appreciate that. But I've been learning a lot of, I think, biblical lessons, scriptural lessons, things that I maybe didn't know before. And it seems like that's why the Lord takes us through trial is to test us, uh, which then is going to produce perseverance and all those kind of things like the scripture says. And so I'm hoping that as I sort of share some lessons from it uh, out of the scripture, that it's an encouragement to you and a build up for you, because that's what I'm here to do is to help build uh, you up as the people of God. Our question today is this, why does God say no sometimes? Why does he say no sometimes? We see Jesus saying what he says in Luke 11, ask, seek, and knock, and it will come. He says the same thing similarly in Matthew 7, and he says in John 16, 24, that anything you ask in my name, you will receive. Whatever we ask the Father, he says, we will receive. So then why does he sometimes say no? We know this, that he does. We've all wondered this. And I think uh, that often the people of God are wondering if he's either not listening or is listening, but maybe sometimes not answering. We've wondered that. We've asked that question. Maybe we've asked God that question before. And I said last week that Satan is a master at stirring up wrong thoughts about God in our eyes so that we will feel cast off like he is, so that we will feel maybe abandoned uh, by God like Satan was. And he wants, us to, he wants to kind of share his misery with us. And so whenever we wonder, why does God say no? Why does God not answer us? We begin to think these kind of wrong thoughts about God. I think Paul understood it as well. He had some weakness that seems to have affected his ministry. And it says that he pled with the Lord to take it away. But the Lord simply said, no, I'm not going to do this. So why does he do this when he says so clearly that if we ask, we will receive? If we knock, the door will be open, and if we seek, we will find. Why then is it that we ask and sometimes we actually don't find? We actually don't get an answer clearly uh, in the moment. I want to give you two reasons today why when we ask God, he says no. The first reason is because sometimes to say yes would mean that we don't go any deeper with him than we already are. I'll say that again. Sometimes to say yes would mean that we don't go any deeper with him than we already are. Think about what James says there in James 4. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask to spend it on your passions. That is to say, maybe to put it a slightly different way, if we were to ask and get the answer we wanted every single time, we would likely just rest on our laurels, go back to the same level of discipleship that we were at before, 
and quite plainly, never grow. And so the Lord, the reality is that it's possible that God wants to take us deeper with himself and for him to give us whatever it is that we're asking for would mean that we're actually not going to go any deeper with him. We would just stay the same that we are, having all of our desires and all of our passions, to use the word that James uh, uses, met, instead of having to wait on the Lord and maybe go his direction. The thing about going deeper with God is this, the deeper you go with him, the more uncomfortable it is at first. The deeper you go, the more uncomfortable you are. If you got everything that you wanted, you would just, like I said, rest on your laurels. But God sometimes chooses no because you need to learn at a deeper level that he is God and you are not. And it's a very important lesson, I think, for all of us to know. It's important in parenting. I know that personally right now with two little ones at home. You can't just give them what they want all the time because what they want all the time uh, isn't the thing that they necessarily need. And how much more so must it be the case with the God of the universe who knows everything and he's answering prayers of sinners uh, like us. He can't give us everything that we want all the time. It wouldn't be good for us. And he, te- and he does this to teach us that he is God and that we are not. I was watching a movie recently where somebody uh, was telling his young protege, he was an old man, he was telling his young protege that there are two things I've learned in my life. One, there is a God, and two, I'm not him. And it's good for us to learn this lesson that he's God and that we are not him. Think about the Psalms. The Psalms are full of longing for God's deliverance and for God's help, where the person is feeling stuck in the darkness and fears that God has abandoned them. You can see this all over the place uh, in the Psalms. I was reading uh, something recently, Randy Alcorn, the pastor, said that a Psalm 88, uh, which is a Psalm that is written just from such a, a dark place, such a deep place of feeling abandoned by God, Alcorn said, does not have a category in many people's kind of strong-minded, jovial, Western evangelicalism. And I'm paraphrasing what he said, but that's basically what he was saying. A lot of people don't have a category for a psalm like Psalm 88, where it's just, it's so dark, it's so bleak, and it feels like the Lord is nowhere near. But just because it feels as though God is nowhere near, that doesn't necessarily mean that he is nowhere near. Instead, As Psalm 138 verse 8 says, God will fulfill his purpose for me and will not forsake the work of his hands. So the psalmist is honest about how it feels a lot of the times, but the psalmist is also clear-minded about the reality that God does not forsake the work of his hands and God fulfills his good purposes. And I think that's why Luke 11, the verse that we read earlier, verses that we read earlier, is so interesting. Jesus quite clearly Uh, says to ask, and it will be given to us by the Father. But note what he says is the ultimate answer that God could give. Not the request that we've asked for, but instead the Holy Spirit. If you ask for good gifts, will the Father not give you the Holy Spirit? That's what Jesus says. Why? Because I think it might be that the request that we're giving to God is not in keeping with his will. Maybe we're not asking for the things that we should ask. So instead of giving us the things that we're asking for, he doesn't grant the request, but he gives us the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, to encourage us, to comfort us in the immediate while he works on all the things that he is working on and while we wait on him. So you see what's happening here. He's taking us deeper. He's strengthening our resolve, strengthening our faith, showing us that we are not God by not giving us the things that maybe we ask just so that we can stay in the same place that we were before. That's one reason. He wants to take us deeper and show us who who really is in control. The second reason why he might say no is because the deliverance will be more glorious once more is overcome. The deliverance will be more glorious once more is overcome. You're familiar with the story from Mark 5, verses 21 to 43, where Jesus is approached by a synagogue ruler named Jairus. And Jairus has a little daughter who's about to die from sickness. So he begs Jesus to come to his house and heal his daughter. So Jesus goes with him. On the way, he gets approached. He's in this big crowd of people and this old woman, actually, I guess we're not really sure if she's old, but a woman who's had this bleeding problem for a long time and doctors have never been able to help her but have only been kind of exacerbating the problem, touches the hem of his garment and immediately she's healed and Jesus wants to find her because he wants to find out you know, what happened here. He finds, he finds this woman and he encourages her faith, but some time goes by there for a little while. And finally, a guy from Jairus' house 
comes and tells Jairus that his daughter has died. So don't bother with the teacher anymore, the guy tells Jairus. Don't bother with him anymore. Your daughter's already gone. Uh, he clearly doesn't care, essentially, is the implication in the story. But Jesus overhears and just looks at Jairus and says, Jairus, don't fear, only believe. Now note what Jesus is doing here. His busyness working on different things is making Jairus sweat it out. He's making Jairus sweat it out. It's a test, isn't it? But just because it's taking a while, that doesn't mean that Jesus isn't going to answer the request. It doesn't mean that glory isn't going to be revealed. So when Jesus gets to the house, everybody is there weeping and wailing loudly because they're professional criers, by the way. If you've ever wondered kind of what's happening there, they had people back then who were professional weepers, professional criers who would show up at, the, at a death and who would help the family members grieve by crying and wailing loudly and playing uh, these kind of like soft, somber songs. And that's why when Jesus tells them that the little girl's only asleep and not dead, they immediately begin to laugh at him. It's not because they're schizophrenic, but it's rather because they're not really crying, so they can just immediately switch to laughing because they're professional criers. But when he gets there, and he goes and takes the little girl, and he gets her up to walk, it says in, in Mark 5.42 that everyone is overcome with amazement. Now let's, let's think about this. Don't you think that it's more amazing to raise her up after everyone is sure that she's dead than to heal her when everyone thinks that she's alive but just sick? It would have been amazing to heal her when she was just sick, but everybody thinks that she's dead. And then Jesus comes into the situation and he raises her back up. And the only way that it happens this way in such the beautiful way that it does is because he took a little while to get there, working on other things. Again, he's testing Jairus. He takes time sometimes to answer the request, but he always goes and he does. Very similar is Lazarus, one of Jesus' best friends. Jesus actually waits a couple of extra days when he hears that Lazarus is sick. Actually, if you read John 11, he lets Lazarus die. He lets him die, basically, while, he, while he's taking a long time to get there. But it's so that he can go, raise Lazarus up, and the disciples can, as it says in John eleven fifteen, 15, see and believe. Jesus says, I'm glad that I wasn't there because I want you to be able to see and to believe. And again, maybe to put a different way what I've already been saying, it will be more glorious to raise the dead even than to heal the sick. In fact, oftentimes the Lord will tarry until we lose something close to us because maybe he wants to raise it up better than it was before. The Lord takes time and he's got good purposes to take time. Maybe that's what God's taking you through right now. Maybe you're going through some kind of trial, some kind of ordeal, some kind of difficult time that's been going only for a short time, maybe for a long time, and you wonder why God is taking so long. Well, as we've already said, it might be that he's waiting because he wants to take you deeper and teach you reality about his being the Lord and your not being him. And maybe it's also because his deliverance after you've gone through more is going to be that much sweeter and that much more glorious than it would have been if he would have delivered you earlier on in the trial and in the difficulty. Let me give you three surprising acts of God in Scripture related to this. Three surprising acts of God in the Scriptures related to this exact topic. One, when he tells Abraham to kill Isaac on the altar, he makes Abraham place Isaac on the altar. He doesn't just have Abraham go with, go with Isaac up to the mountain. He doesn't just have him set up the altar. He makes him set it up and place Isaac on the altar. Abraham assumed that God could and indeed would raise Isaac back up from the dead if it came to it. It says that to us in the scriptures. But can you just imagine having to go through uh, what Abraham had to go through? I can't. My, uh, my son is the most important thing in the world to me. Of course, I love my daughter too. I love them both the same, but, but, my, but my son, he's my, my three-year-old Isaiah. He's my, he's my three-year-old best friend. And uh, we, do, we do everything together. We love each other. And I know pretty sure that he loves me, I think. But I just cannot imagine, cannot imagine having to go through the thing that Abraham went through that night. But God made him go all the way to that length. And that's surprising to us. Another example, he made Israel, when he was about to make the sea go up so they could walk through the Red Sea, he made them walk all the way up to the sea, didn't he? 
close enough for Moses to walk into the sea and part it with his staff. But can you imagine the congregation of people approaching the sea and they're sweating it out as they're running out of land? Moses, what are we doing? We're about to walk into the water and we can't just swim all the way across the sea. Why does God allow this to happen? Make them sweat it out like that. He let it happen. And maybe a third example in scripture of him doing something similar would be when Peter steps out of the boat to walk on the water to Jesus and he's got his footing, he's walking on water just like Jesus is. Great courage that Peter had to trust in the Lord like that. But when he gets out there, he gets distracted. He begins probably to go back to thinking like he normally thinks, which is like the way that we would think how this is impossible. And he begins to sink and Jesus even lets him sink for just a few seconds, seems like before he goes over to him and saves him when Peter calls out to him. Why does Jesus let that happen? Why does God let this happen? He he, he just, he does this kind of thing all the time. In every instance that I've just named, he pushes the believer and the follower to the absolute end of their nerves, pushes them to the absolute end of their nerves, but then he meets them, delivers them, and rescues his beloved when the time is right. I think that's why the Psalms are the way that they are. As I mentioned earlier, some of these Psalms are written from such a deep, dark place, emotionally, personally, spiritually. But then you have the other Psalms that the Lord has delivered me in the past and he'll deliver me again. People cry out from that pit because they know that despite their feelings and doubts, God hears them, God will deliver them. He always has. But sometimes he wants to stretch the faith of his followers. And he wants to perform the deliverance in a way that they will know in the end that it was only him who could have done what he's done. And it'll make such an impression on their hearts that it's not going to go away easily. And in the end, when we look back, we we look back and we say, man, I'm glad that God did it the way that he did it. I might have been sweating it out in the middle of the process. I might have been running out of land. I might have been sinking in the water. But I'm glad that he did it the way that he did it because I learned that he's God that he cares for me, and that he always fulfills his promises. I think that's what makes a mature Christian, somebody who has had a lifetime of tests and deliverances, and to to the point where they know that God is always there for them, and that God always delivers on his promises, even if it means making me sweat it out until he meets me. Perhaps the most surprising act of all is that God even let himself be overwhelmed for a time by the evil of the world. I want to be clear what I mean here. He let himself be overwhelmed by the evil systems of the world and by the the propensity to injustice and unfairness in the world. Let himself be overwhelmed by it so that those who are beaten up by the world and ready for true justice, a buzzword we hear today, would find it whenever they find him. We wonder why the world is so messed up We wonder why things are just so divided, why it seems like such darkness in the world all the time. Who could possibly save us? Who could possibly save the world? And then what happens? Jesus comes into the messed upness and he suffers so that we will know that he's the one who not only reverses the curse of of Adam and Eve's sin, but that he's the one who can actually deliver us out of the wickedness and the fallenness that, that touches every part of our being. God doesn't stay aloof from the suffering. God gets involved in the suffering. God doesn't stay off to the side. God comes in and he gets involved. He even goes through the suffering himself. Indeed, it involved a great amount of suffering. I was thinking the other day, reflecting on this in my office from Isaiah 53, that Jesus bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. The world is full of sorrow. Life is full of sorrow. Life is full of griefs. But it says that every grief Jesus identified with, is that true? Is that the case? Yes, it is. He understands. He knows it. And it's extremely comforting to think that whatever it is that I'm going through as a follower of the living God, Jesus understands. He's been through it too. Tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. That means tested in every way to some degree that we are, yet without sin. He understands. The Son of God, when he was on the cross, without questioning the Father's purposes, 
We don't want to say he ever questioned the Father's purposes because Peter says that, that he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So he never questioned the Father's purposes. Yet when he hung there on the cross, he asked God, God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? He's, he not only was quoting the Psalms there and, and thus preaching all the way to the end, but to some degree he is saying that he feels forsaken there at the cross. To some degree, the eternal loving relationship between the Father and the Son for a brief moment changed. And Jesus apparently was feeling the change in the very core of his being, feeling alone, feeling abandoned. And yet, as Spurgeon said once, Jesus not only went to that place, but he stayed in that place until the work was done. So that you and I would know that God doesn't abandon us. If ever there was a reason why he could, that reason was exhausted through the work that Jesus did for us at the cross. Now we know he's never going to abandon us. He's never going to forsake us. Jesus did all of this so that we would know that the one who calls us to take up the cross and wait on the Lord hangs on his own cross for us and waits on the Lord too. The question is, did the Father raise him up? Yes, he did. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, he raised him up. Death was not the end of the story. And Jesus knew it. It's for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Therefore, we ask the question for ourselves. Whatever we're going through, whatever dark time we might be going through, whatever trial we're going through, is he going to raise me up in the end? You better believe it. You better believe it. That's what the, that's what the gospel promises us. Because Jesus went to the cross and rose up again. You and I, as we take up the cross and follow him, even if it means being pushed all the way to the absolute end of ourselves, he's going to raise us up. He might be saying no to us in the, in the meantime for deliverance, but it's because there are other things that he's working on. And he's going to meet us and bring us out when the time is exactly right, when the time is perfect. So... Why did Abraham have to suffer like he did? Why did he have to put Isaac on the altar and go all the way to that point? It was a test. Why did Israel have to walk all the way up to the Red Sea before God showed them what he was going to do? It was a test. Think even about David as well. Such suffering that that man experienced all throughout his life. You read the Psalms, they're suffering outside of him, they're suffering inside of him, all kinds of things. Wrestling with people who hate him, wrestling with God even, wrestling with his own sin. Why? It's a test. Why was Peter allowed to sink even for just a time on the sea? It was a test. And me and my suffering, you and your suffering, whatever struggles, whatever trials you're going through, why does he let it happen? It's a test. Constant testing. But keep this in mind. It can't be a loveless testing. Otherwise, he wouldn't have come into the world and gone through it himself. That proves to us that any testing that we go through in this life is for our good. It's full of love from the Father. That's why Peter can say, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. You know what that means? If necessary. It means you need them. It needs to happen so that you can be tested. And so that you can be not only tested, but refined and made into the beautiful image of the living Christ that you're made to be. It only happens through testing. And in fact, this testing, this loving testing that God gives us is identifying us with him more deeply and more closely so that when he delivers, we will know that it was him and rejoice in him even more. Why does God say no sometimes? Because he loves us. He says no because he loves us. And when he answers, when he meets us, and when he brings us out of the pit, we will know it fully. The question is, in the midst of the darkness or in the midst of the hard time, can we take our hearts and our minds back to the cross to be reminded that even in the midst of this, that proves to me that he loves me. And I'm gonna to cling to that, I'm gonna to cling to Jesus, and one of these days when he brings me out of this and restores to me the joy of his salvation, I not only am going to rejoice in his glory, his goodness, his kindness, his love, his fatherly care for me, but I can also take heart that I endured and I clung to Jesus and he clung to me.
It's not gonna be about my works and my faithfulness. It's gonna be about his. He loves me. He's loved me. He's given himself for me. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Saying that even in the midst of great trial, writing a difficult letter. You read the book of Galatians, it's a very difficult letter where he's scathing people whom he loves. He's dealing with a lot of hardships, probably a lot of painful experiences, people constantly challenging his own teaching and preaching. And yet, what does he say in Galatians 2? I live my life by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the plausibility structure for all all of the Apostle Paul's reality. And it's not just meant to be that way because he's a special man who wrote a lot of the New Testament. That's meant to be the experience of every believer. That whatever we're going through, however it might feel like the Lord is not answering, maybe not listening perhaps, maybe that's what it feels like, it's never the case that he's not listening, but it's just what it feels like sometimes. I'm going to preach to myself He loved me and gave himself for me. That means that he loves me and he's going to pull me through this too. Even if I might have to sink for a little bit, even if I might have to be pushed all the way to the end of myself, it's for my good because he loves me. So I hope that you're encouraged by that today. And I hope that that grips your heart even now and on into eternity. Let's pray together. So, Father, we reflect upon all that you've done to show us your steadfast love and your grace and your mercy. What we need is both truth, you're God, we're not, you're good, we're sinners, and grace, you forgive us. You promise us that you will forgive us. You put us into a state of grace through the Lord Jesus. You are a merciful Father, gracious, loving God. Even, that's even on the truth side as well. It's just your very nature. God is love. Oh, Lord. Whatever we're going through, write it on our hearts. Press it into our consciences so that we can truly rest in the living Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. We know that this is a prayer that we pray that you you are not going to say no to because this is a prayer that you tell us to pray as we pray for your kingdom to come, your will to be done, and your name to be hallowed. That's all we're saying. And so we know that you hear us. We know that you'll listen. And we know that whatever valley we might find ourselves in, it's just a valley. There's a mountaintop on the other side. And you are with us. Your rod and your staff comforts us. And though you might push us to the end of ourselves, it's so that we will cling to you who clings to us. Thank you for that promise, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you ultimately for the Holy Spirit who strengthens us and comforts us every step of the way. And we pray all this in the name of the risen Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord bless you today. Bye.